BBOR Black Box Online Radio, coming to you from West Virginia. And hello everybody, today is Monday, another Zodiac Monday. Welcome to the show. How's everybody doing? Hope everyone had a good weekend. Right now, I am in the Holiday Inn here in West Virginia, and this is actually the location that used to be known as the Sheraton Hotel, which was featured in the Netflix docuseries American Conspiracy, The Octopus Murders, talking about the suspicious death of Danny Casolaro. And I have a two-part uh, episode series about that, if anyone would like to check that out. But right now, we're going to be talking about the Zodiac Killer, and it is a pleasure to welcome Melissa Rose Tapa back to the program. She's been a guest on here before, and we also have Thor Thornton Daniel Jeffrey with us, also known as Jeff Thornton, and they're going to be sharing some info about their Zodiac suspect, Loring Dale Hill, L.D. Hill. As previously stated, Melissa's been on the program before, and I have one interview with her. I've also talked a lot about L.D. Hill in some of the Zodiac Killer News Report episodes, but we haven't had a chance to hear from Jeff yet. And I think that this is going to be a very good opportunity for them to talk about their Zodiac Killer suspect. Firstly, I would like to say hello to Jeff and Melissa. Hello, Ned. Hi, Ned. Good to be back. And hello to both of you. Now, Jeff, I would like to begin with you because this is a suspect that has a personal connection to your family. And would you like to give us an introduction? Uh, absolutely. So um, uh, w our suspect is Loring Dale Hill, uh, which is my grandfather, uh, who served in the U.S. Navy from 1954 to 1974, lived and worked in Alameda and the Bay Area um, from Ohio, uh, retired and moved back there. And um, basically, uh, we got some information uh, based off of some other information and we shared that and we have been digging into the suspect for th about three years now and we got pretty far with it and uh, my partner Melissa which is now my wife uh, we together as a team have been working on this case and we believe uh, wholeheartedly that this is the suspect behind these murders. And Melissa, would you like to give an introduction? Uh, yeah, as Jeff had mentioned, you know, we've been looking into this case for, you know, about almost two and a half to three years based on a, a tip from a family member. And, you know, again, like I had shared uh, earlier previously when we sat down and chatted, that I just began to kind of take the you know, the small minute piece of information and I started digging and one piece of information led to another piece of information and a lot of it is very much in line with what we know about the Zodiac case when it pertains to this individual. Uh, and so, yeah, we're just happy to be here to discuss it and get your thoughts and take questions on the chat. Okay, absolutely, and we're going to get to that. But because this is Zodiac Monday, I always tell you guys that this show has a donation page at buymeacoffee.com, buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxnet88, and anybody who makes a donation or a contribution to help the show will get a shout-out on Zodiac Monday. So I'm going to do that really fast. Firstly, giving one to uh, Batman66, thank you so much, and also for helping out with the YouTube shorts. And last week I said that anybody who made a donation – would have their funds go to helping out some people who lost their home in a house fire. The next one comes to us from River Prawn Pottery, who donated both to the show and to help the people who lost their home. Mega thanks going your way. And we had one from Classic Chevy Cattle, buymeacoffee.com, who was very, very supportive. And finally, the last one came to us from Travis Miller, another great researcher who has really looked into a lot of different true crime aspects involving the Zodiac case as well as Lawrence Kane. Thank you guys so much for helping out that family in need. And now we're going to get back to the suspect that we're talking about today, Loring Dale Hill. And Jeff and Melissa, both of you guys, this suspect was Jeff's grandfather. What sets your suspect apart from these other my daddy did it stories, my stepfather was the Zodiac killer? Why is this person of interest different? I mean, I would say just the sheer amount of 
circumstantial information that we have pertaining to this suspect is overwhelming. You know, his height was six foot, his weight was in between 168 and 200 pounds over the last couple of years. He was known and lived and worked and was assigned on the USS Enterprise based at NAS Alameda at the time. He had a vast knowledge of of, you know, blueprinting, of maps, of aviation, of, you know, being a rescue pilot, of being a mechanic. Um, he had interest in the opera. He had, uh, he would sing in his choir in high school, so he had an interest of singing. Uh, his mother was a writer, a journalist. She also was a trained vocalist in the opera as well. So we see throughout, when we look at this case, you know, I think areas of of um, influence that not every suspect carries. If that makes sense. Oh yes, absolutely. And I would like to turn it over to Jeff. When did you first suspect that your grandfather might have been the Zodiac killer of the nineteen sixties? Sure. Um, <clears throat> my mother and I had a conversation, and she had given me some information about him. Um, I have heard nothing but good things about him up until that point. Um, and um, <clears throat> when I found out that my mother went to high school and uh, went to grade school in that area, Alameda, California, I then, you know, began to tell M Melissa, uh, my wife, uh, I said to her, I said, I think that my grandfather might be the Zodiac. And uh, he looked like the suspect, I mean, almost identical. And we kind of carried it from there. And that uh, was a road trip coming back from Indianapolis to Chicago, speaking with my mother. And soon after that, I reached out to the person that I most trusted the most, and that's Melissa. We've been friends for, you know, almost 30 years, known each other for a long time, and we've always stayed in contact. So, you know, I knew she was really smart. I did not know at that time of her college and her interest into this kind of psychology and and uh, an interest in uh, true crimes and stuff like that. Neither one of us had really no idea about the Zodiac. It was kind of the first time, that, you know, as we started to look into this and a lot of credit to Melissa with her, you know, taking her, her precious time to go into this. And, uh, we just kind of, you know, just started collaborating back and forth with this and start, we believe I'm puzzling, you know, who he is, uh, what he did, uh, and, uh, just trying to fill in and, you know, the questions that we had, like the whys and the what's and, um, you know, and then we kind of just, you know, went from there and it was like both sides, you know, about two and a half, almost three years ago. Okay. Though. So I'm sure the audience would really like to know what are some strong pieces of evidence that you have found that would indicate that LD Hill was the Zodiac. And I would like to begin with you, Melissa. I'm sure as I, as I said, you know, when Jeff brought me this story, I just I took that piece of information um, and went on Ancestry.com and I found his mom's high school yearbook picture right there in Alameda at the same time that the murders were happening. So then I built a family tree around her because I didn't even know her dad's name. So I started to really dig in and build the family tree. Who was his, who was her father? Who were his siblings? Who are his siblings? His parents? What were their backgrounds? Um, you know, where was he from? Where did he live? Where is he buried? Um, what was his occupation? And I gathered his occupation from his gravestone, and it said AMS two. And I had no idea what that was. So of course, I Google it. <laughs> and it was Aviation Structural Mechanic 2. And I think the thing that first struck me and reeled me in was the fact that I know, you know, wing walker boots were found, but footprints were found at the scene of at least two of the murders, one of which is definitely attributed to the Zodiac. The other one isn't. 
And um, when I found out that he was actually a Navy aviator, it's pretty much 100% that he was assigned these wing walker boots. He didn't just pick them up at a Army surplus store, especially in the mid to late 60s. I don't think there would be a surplus of these boots back then. But I knew he, he wore them. He needed them for his job. And so from there, I went to Jeff and I said, hey, do you have pictures of him? Do you have you know, handwriting samples. And he produced four pictures of him from when he was in the Navy, one of which had a very small piece of handwriting on it. And that picture was him uh, in boot camp. He uh, started the Navy in 1954, and it wrote boot camp at the bottom. The handwriting was slanted from left bottom, slanted up as he wrote right, you know, the directionally. And then at the top lower or the top upper left corner, he wrote me with a underline under it. And I thought that was interesting. So I know it's him and I know this is his handwriting. And and so from there, every piece of information I uncovered seems to fit. Um, I mean, I first said, well, let me go into this. When I saw the pictures, that was a striking resemblance. He had the dark you know, horn rim glasses. He had the bomber jacket on. He's standing in front of what I thought was a plane. It turns out to be a helicopter. But he also was sitting in the helicopter and he had kind of a pot belly. So he was fat, but he was definitely a bigger guy. Um, and I, at the time, I had no idea like what his weight or his height was or any other information. So I thought, I need his military records. <laughs> so I went on a mission to try and get his military records, which took over 18 months to get. A lot of it was delay with the pandemic, I think. Um, but finally, I did get my hands on it. But I didn't stop investigating. I, I looked up every squadron that was assigned. Um, I then thought, well, let me see what I can find about him in the newspapers. So I went on newspaper.com. I found his local newspaper in the Marysville Journal in Ohio, and I find out that his mother was the feeder correspondent from North Lewisburg into Marysville. And so back then in the 60s, 50s and 60s, they would write personal sections. And so I found every article that she ever mentioned about him, you know, being home and what he did. And there was an article about the USS Enterprise that he was, um, he reported safe from this fire. So then I started digging into the fire and what the USS Enterprise and all the air squadrons to try and pinpoint which squadron he would have been in to get more information on what influenced his activities, what influenced his writings, were any of these symbols and the ciphers related to his occupation. And, you know, from there, I've looked for every single, some clue to tell me that this has ruled him out, and it hasn't. I'm not saying he's 100%. But there still isn't something that says, Melissa, you're wasting your time on this story. Melissa, I would like to stay with you because you mentioned the handwriting. Do you have any other similarities between your suspect's handwriting and the Zodiac Killer's handwriting found in the letters and ciphers that you would like to talk about? Oh, that's – there's a lot, actually. A lot of um, – I would say he used a lot of the same innuendos. We can start there. So, for example, in the Badlands letter where he talks about um, Kit and – who's the other character? Holly. Thank you. Kit and Holly back in 1959 were killing people or and then I was killing time or whatever. Fast forward nine to 12 months later, we get more pictures. We get originals of pictures of when LD was stationed on the USS Saratoga and I flip one of the pictures around and it says killing time. And this picture, he was stationed in on the Saratoga in 1959. There's also, you know, on backs of these pictures, he writes ha, which is, you know, we know the Zodiac Killer like to write ha a lot. Um, there was a picture of Jane's man, Jane Mansfield from when she visited the ship to entertain the troops. And at the bottom, he just writes guess who with a question mark. I mean, these are kind of similar phrases that we know the Zodiac also used. But then when you look at the framing of the handwriting, I would say, I mean, we can start with probably, um, I mean, I would just say we could start backwards. I think what was striking to me is when I obtained his military records, I saw his, his form and which also had more samples of his handwriting. And I know that the 2001, the New Year's Eve card is not necessarily 
uh, proven to be Zodiac. You know, it's it's disputed. But the letters on that envelope where the, all the T's are capitalized on his military form, he also uses all the capitalized T's. The A is very similar. Um, I mean, so that's one example. I think another one would probably just be... Um, and again, I know that the Riverside poem is also disputed, but there's another picture of all the kids where he writes all their names, and I can't really share that right now. But I can tell you that the right the handwriting on that picture is also similar to the desk poem. Um, and then I think the ciphers you really can't tell because those were really traced and very neatly um, organized. So that I really wouldn't say. Um, but those are the ones that come up the top of my head for right now, Ned. Okay, though, but I think what you're trying to say is that he had a very big habit of blending lowercase letters and capital letters, especially the capitals when they did not belong. And the Zodiac Killer definitely did that. For example, the Halloween card, the by rope, by knife, by gun, by fire, that blends lowercase letters and capital letters. Is that where you were going at? Uh, yes, that's absolutely correct. Mm-hmm. Now, you mentioned the 2001 card, and as I understand, you have some very interesting observations about that, or perhaps we could even call it a hypothesis. What do you think happened with the 2001 card? And either Jeff or Melissa can respond to this one. Who wants this? Okay, so our suspect died in 1996, okay? And we, as others have said that they believe that there's more than one suspect. And we believe that as well. We believe that there is a partner to this. Um, and we actually right now can't put that name out there at this point. Um, that does also match the sketch of the, the, of the opposite sketch of the original Zodiac sketch okay. of Lake Berryessa. So uh, we do believe that there's a possibility that this handwriting could be for more than just one person, and that's kind of where we're at with that. Right, and as I understood some things, you were also going at that maybe the card could have been written prior to his death and it was just never mailed, and this active participant mailed the card. Is that also right? Right. That's our theory at the moment. Mm -hmm. And what uh, Jeff was talking about when he says the um, opposite sketch, this is referring to the Lake Berryessa voyeur. Of course, everybody knows the sketch with, from the Stein murder that has the light-colored hair and the glasses, but the Lake Berryessa voyeur is the one with the more rectangular face and the dark-colored hair, and I'm sure most of you guys have seen that, just providing a little bit of clarity. But now to both of you, I want to stay with the handwriting for just one second because you've also shared some things with me about how the Zodiac Killer would – draw or write numbers, and the suspect that you have, L.D. Hill, wrote some numbers in a similar way. Would you like to answer something about that, Melissa? Uh, yes. Yeah, so a lot of the, the pictures that we found from 1959 and 1960, mm -hmm. as well as his USS Saratoga cruise book, had strikingly similar form to what the Zodiac Killer had written on the door um, at the, the Lake Carmen Road. No, the Lake Berryessa murder. Um, and so the six is the same. The zero is the same. I mean, it's just almost as you couldn't really tell if two people did, wrote this. I mean, it looks like this exact same person wrote these, whatever wrote the numbers on the back of these pictures and in the front of his cruise book, he dedicated his cruise book to his mom and his dad. And it has 1960 on it. Um, they're very similar. So you wouldn't really be able to tell the difference between that and what was written on the door at Lake Berryessa. Okay, though, and this is for both of you. You have appeared on the channel before, Melissa, and you were also talking about your website, ZodiacKillerBomb.com, which I invite people to listen to. You have a Facebook group called The Zodiac Killer and Me, and what I got in the comments section as a form of feedback is, all right, we understand some of the coincidences. We understand some things about the timeline and the military background, but what people didn't quite get is, why exactly do you think the suspect, L.D. Hill, would go on this murderous spree in 1968 and 69? And you have some very detailed reasons as to why you think he committed this. Who would like to take this one? And we are going to stay with Melissa. Okay, so 
Uh, family folklore, we'll just call it that because it's not a proven episode or incident. But um, back when uh, LD was stationed in Texas, in Kingsville, and he was married at the time to Jeff's grandmother, um, who had two small children and then was also pregnant with her third, a son, uh, discovered LD's um, unfaithfulness, we'll call it. Uh, And we don't know what happened. Obviously, none of us were there. But at some point, she, the story is that she decided to leave. um, And we don't know, you know, whether or not who helped her try to leave, but the story is that it was a male, it was a cab driver that was packing her things, and LD walked into that, stopped it, and supposedly, allegedly, unproven, shot this man who happened to, we think, maybe be a cab driver. And it was either on or near the base um, of where they lived. And um, he, the police showed up, he claimed it was a home invasion, Um, And we believe she was trying to get a cab to the train station to leave. And meanwhile, he is entertaining, you know, this other person and his life um, that had no idea that he had a family. Um, Right. And And I I really have to jump in there. Do you mean he was having an affair? uh, Yes. Mm -hmm. And so we don't know if it's crime of passion, but we believe he claimed it was like a home invasion, but he got off scot-free, was never arrested or charged. So he got away with murder in 1957 that we allegedly are told this happened. Now, of course, we're still trying to find evidence of who this victim was. This was a very long time ago. You know, um, records and they're not digitized prior to, I believe, 1965. So it's going to be a lot of legwork to try and prove that the story even happened. And this is going to go to both of you because you said that it's been alleged that he committed the murder of a taxi driver in 1957. Mm -hmm. But there's a very famous crime that could possibly be attributed to the Zodiac Killer, and that is the 1962 murder of Ray Davis, the taxi driver from Oceanside. Now, who would like to answer this one? Do you believe your suspect was responsible for that crime? I mean, I I do. It's definitely – it sounds like him. Uh, It sounds like his MO. It fits his MO. Uh, I know, too, you know, his father worked for the railroad. They had several family members that worked for Erie Railroad in Ohio. He worked for the railroad as well in high school, and I believe it was Ross Geraci. Um, he's really focuses a lot on these Southern California crimes that may or may not, most likely may not, who knows, uh, be attributed to the Zodiac. And he had made a comment on one of his shows or in his interviews when discussing this case that they were all near, like, railroads. So that definitely stuck out to me when I'm thinking about L.D. Hill, whether he was there, whether he wasn't, there was, I've extensively studied his military history, and I can pinpoint him almost from 1954 where he was at till he re- he went reserve in 73 and retired in 74, but there is this window between 1965 and 1967 that's a black hole that I cannot pinpoint where he is. I know he was in training to um, get again, um, re-ascertain his AMS-2 status. He was AMS-3. And so that training was based out of Memphis. But from there, he was also all the way up in Whidbey Island. He was all over the place. They ended up in California, I believe in either 66, definitely in 67 he was there. And so there's a lot of gaps when it comes to the South, the Southern California crimes. But yes, the MO, it fits. It fits, yeah. Well, now, wait a second. I heard two things in there. Mm-hmm. The first one was that you think your suspect committed the murder of Ray Davis or you highly entertain the possibility. And then the second was most likely it was not the Zodiac. Which one is it? Well, other – the community thinks, you know, that it's not – there's a divided camp, right? Not everybody believes that the Oceanside or like the Dominguez murders or Sherry Joe Base, any of these were really Zodiac. But yet they all share the same thread when it comes to the activity, the MO. And I don't think that anybody would really attribute that murder of Ray Davis to him if that murder of Paul Stein had not happened in 1969 to see the two, right, the, the stark similarities. And I know others have said, well, it's almost as if he started a chapter in 62 and closed it in 69, 
kind of full circle, starting with the cab driver and ending with the cab driver. I definitely do. I do agree with that for sure. Yeah. So it sounds like you're saying that um, you think that it's a strong possibility that he committed the murder of Ray Davis, but you're not completely sold on it. Is that what you would say? You know, I'm not sold on any of it until we get physical evidence, right? But I do believe that the circumstantial evidence is strong enough to continue to look very closely at this suspect, whether it be, you know, the Ray Davis murder, the Dominguez murderers, even Sherry, Sherry Jo mm -hmm. Bates. If we have to pause that and then look closely, obviously, at the murders in the Bay Area first and start there and work our way back, that's fine, too. You know, Jeff and I are collecting kind of cold cases along the way as we dig into looking at the area specifically to California, but also Ohio, um, and not really, we're going to try to not leave any stone unturned, but, you know, we've got full-time jobs and families, and this is kind of our side gig for the time being, so only only as time allows. Right, but you did mention the Domingo Edwards murders of 1963, and what is your take on that one, anybody? I... Okay, so again, as I keep that in mind, as I'm looking at what I know about my suspect, and I found, as I was reviewing his military records, that um, he had this scar on his forehead that was not listed in his military records in July 23rd, 1957, in his form. But it was documented on July 24th, 1963, and continued through his records through until he retired in 73, um, or until he went on reserve in 73. He retired in 74. And so, again, as we were kind of chatting about this case, and I would, at the back of my mind, I made a mental note. Okay, the Dominguez murders, I know he fought back against the assailant. Did he punch him? Did he injure the Zodiac, if it was the Zodiac killer? Who killed him? Did he punch him in the face or in the head? Were there injuries? Because it sounded like it was a pretty violent scene. Um, and so when I saw that this scar showed up on July 24th, 1963, I thought that's very interesting, knowing everything else I know about, you know, him being in the Scorpion squadron, why there was a Scorpion letter, him in um, the – the zappers with the the dragon scorpion why would he write the dragon card you know all of these things cannot just be coincidence and so to me it's just another kind of feather in the hat that that we need to keep looking at this guy well yes we can come back to those letters later on yeah. but i think that we just need to state this again for the audience you mean that previously prior to uh, 1963 it was not reported that he had the scar mm -hmm. on his forehead and we don't necessarily know a hundred percent where that came from mm -hmm. but it was first documented what date did you say july july 24th 1963 and it was on the left side about a quarter inch okay and that was of course let's see about maybe seven weeks six seven weeks after the domingo edwards murders yes okay though now if we go chronologically um Maybe even we can come back to the Swindle murders later in 1964. But with the murder of Sherry Jo Bates, you guys have a lot of observations about that one. And would you like to keep going? I mean, yeah, I just – the we – you know, we know he was issued a typewriter in the military. You know, the blue – the very famous blue typewriter that's even on the cover of Tom Volt's, Voigt's book. It looks identical to that. We We, we know that. And so – whether he typed the confession letter, whether it was someone else, the obviously we know the language is very similar. There are a lot of theories as to why, you know, that twitch and squirm showed up four, three to four years later in Northern California. But I find that it would be very difficult for someone to pick that confession letter out of a newspaper on the other side of the state three to four years later, and then integrated into the Zodiac case. I just think that is more improbable than it being the exact same person who typed the confession letter and then also used the same vernacular in the letters that he wrote in Northern Cal, in the Bay Area. Well, that is relevant to one of the letters that came after the Zodi or after the murder of Sherry Joe Bates. There are three sets of writing. First, we have the Riverside Confession in November of 66. Then we have the discovery of the desktop poem in 1966, uh, December of that year, excuse me. And then in the spring of 1967, we had the Bates had to die letters. Mm -hmm. But I guess I was more asking, do you believe your suspect committed that murder? 
I believe that if everything we have is true about him in the northern part of the state, in the Bay Area, that it's very highly probable he also did the the Riverside murder. And I'm not the first one to say that. You know, law enforcement believed that too. Um, you know, I can address that this teenage kid came forward about the Bates letters claiming it's a hoax. I don't really believe that. I don't believe that the um, method in which that evidence was um, ascertained was really like by the book. And again, I'm not a forensic, uh, evidence expert, <laughs> but from what I've kind of can gather, it was, you know, it wasn't exactly like clean. Now, with that being said, Riverside law enforcement wants absolutely nothing to do with the Zodiac case. So if I were to try and talk to Riverside, which we all know they won't, I wouldn't even bring up the Zodiac case. I would say, listen, this suspect LD Hill was in the military. He had knowledge of mechanics, right? He was a military mechanic. I can prove that. He was. He could have been there on training in 1966. We don't know. But um, the wing walker boots, the Timex watch, these are military-issued um, items. And he was a very personable person. You know, when I when I research and talk to people that knew him. He was the funny one. He was the, really the more personable one out of all of his siblings. And I think that he could definitely, you know, gain someone's trust pretty easily. So whether he was there to look up, study for a test he had on, on at the base or there teaching a class at the community college, I have no idea. That's something I need to close. But I do believe he fits. I also think when you look at his picture and you put it next to Ross Sullivan, I mean, they look very, very similar. And I think that's probably why Ross Sullivan was pinpointed, because the description of this person that didn't show up at the reenactment the next day, you know, 200 people show up in this one person they're looking for who fits the description of Ross Sullivan. He also fits the description of L.D. Hill. Could it be him? I mean, possibly. So um, and then. You know, whether or not the Zodiac Killer created murders in the southern part of the state or the northern part of the state, to me, is irrelevant. When we look at the Golden State Killer, he was committing different crimes in northern California than he was in southern California. And they were completely two different MOs. And it actually turned out to be the exact same person. But it was a lot of work, you know, for like Michelle McNamara who put in a ton of work to try and coordinate and, and, and create relationships with like Paul and these other people and, you know, her true crime blogging and getting, just trying to organize all of this and get everybody on the same page with task force. It's a lot of work to get people to see this when they don't, you know, the two ends don't always meet. They don't look similar. They, they, you know, you've got that denial that sets in. And I agree. I'm, I'm part of that too. I look at something when we're looking at his military records, I was thinking he was six two or six four but then i'm looking at it and it, it blatantly says 72 inches and i'm like wait a minute that's six feet which is what sherry joe base said he he's she you know attributed his height to about six feet you mean cecilia Shepard? i'm sorry cecilia Shepard. i apologize yes thank you ned and so when i find those realizations i it, it makes me step back and then my denial start this can't be true this can't be true this is just too crazy but I have to kind of step outside of that, that sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. Okay, though, Melissa, but mm -hmm. if we go and order them, in 1967, there's a crime that you think could possibly have been the Zodiac Killer, which I've never heard before from anyone. And the name of the victim was Dominga Montoya. And would you like to provide an introduction to her story? Because you are the first ones to tell me about her. And I think a lot of people in the audience would be uh, very curious to know how she could possibly fit into the Zodiac Killer's narrative and also just to get some background information on this case. Uh, yeah, so as I was looking into, you know, the Riverside case, um, I, you know, it struck me that he said, you know, and again, if he wrote these letters, Bates must die. But he also says in his confession letter, there will be more. I mean, he's definitely, he's out to get, women as victims. They are his tar this person's target. I came across the case of Dominga Montoya, and she was actually in Bakersfield, which is, I mean, I don't know how far it is. I'm from Chicago, but it is not, it's in the vicinity. It's Southern California. It might be maybe an hour 
north of Riverside or two hours. You guys in the comments can correct me. But Dominga Montoya, and she was murdered on April 28th, 1967, which is two days before um, the Bates letters, right? Because the confession letter was in October, I believe. November, November. And so she was, Domingo was 22 years old. She was bludgeoned in a laundromat at like, I don't know, around 1030 at night, 22, 23 years old. It's still a cold case to this day. Um, she was bludgeoned with a hammer that was found about 16 blocks away. Um, she was, she worked for a prominent, um, member of government. I don't remember whether it was like a Senator, but it was somebody in government. And I just, I felt like, okay, if there's going to be more, this one might be one of them. So instead of a library, it's a laundromat. She fits about the same exact age. It's still unsolved to this day. You know, was he just passing through? Um, and originally when I nailed down Bakersfield, I was looking at Bakersfield because I had thought that, you know, his mother had went to, it was called Chipman Junior High. And I was researching Chipman Junior High that led me to Bakersfield. But then I realized that there was a Chipman Junior High in Alameda, but it's renamed the Academy, I believe the Academy of Alameda, so forth. So then I just have tabled this Dominga Montoya case, which is just, it's still unsolved but I feel like, you know what, I mean, we don't know. We don't know what happened, but it sounds like it fits the description of just the anger that he had toward, you know, women of this age, the violence, you know, her clothing was ripped, which is another kind of, again, part of that MO of the murders in Southern California, too. Okay, though, and when you were talking about the connection about the Chipman Junior High School, did you just mean that it's a coincidence that... He um, had a family member going there or that you think he was actually targeting that place because of the similarity in the name or what exactly was your take on that? I mean, I, I don't know. All I know is this laundromat was like six or seven blocks from that Chipman Junior High. But I now feel like the Chipman Junior High was the one in Alameda. It was not the one in Bakersfield. So it's by t pure chance and coincidence that I came across this cold case to kind of add it into the Rolodex, so to speak. Um, but I'm hoping, you know, we can kind of solve this Montoya case and bring closure to the family as well. Um, it isn't a case that's known or talked about. And so if I can at least bring some awareness to it through talking about it, I'm happy to do that, too. You mean that um, it was more or less a coincidence that you stumbled upon the case, yes. but it seemed like it was relevant to the either the Zodiac's murders or the murderer of Sherry Joe Bates's pattern. Correct. Yes. Now this is this point we are moving onward to the Bay Area in 1968 and 69. And Melissa, you have been a guest on the program before, and again, people can read your website zodiackillerbomb.com. But what exactly? happened with the Bay Area because this is something that is so different. I mean, you just have somebody in Southern California committing murders. Maybe he wrote three sets of letters, but then the Zodiac Killer goes way beyond that. He develops a persona. He becomes a domestic terrorist. He's making bomb threats. He's threatening to go after school buses, all of these different things. And we have the Lake Herman Road murders in 1968, the Blue Rock Springs shooting in July of 69, the Lake Berryessa stabbing in September of 69, and the Stein murder in October. What exactly do you think pushed the Zodiac Killer over the edge? And you can answer in regards to your suspect or you can answer in regards to anything. But why this massive intensity in 1969? What do you think made the Zodiac turn himself into a domestic terrorist and someone who's going to make bomb threats as well as just to go on kill rampages and to have this whole Zodiac character that he created? Oh, that's a loaded question, Ned, but... Well, maybe I can try and simplify it. Why attribute the Zodiac persona to this uh, set of crimes in the 1960s, the late 1960s? Well, I think, okay, I, I'm going to break down your question in a couple different areas. So number one, what was the motive? And the motive, we believe, contributing back to 1957, what happened in Texas where, you know, his family fell apart. Uh, his first wife leaves, takes the kids. Um, but he and his first wife were high school sweethearts. 
And so I feel like not only was, and then whoever helped her leave was supposedly a cab driver. And so for me, that's a really interesting similarity between LD's life and then what, who the Zodiac decides to target. And I know like Mike Morford, he talks about this Melina, uh, Endeline, uh, Endeline, Melina and Furman Hernandez murders in Alameda County, California on June 8th, 1967. They were both parked on a secluded lover's lane area. Both were shot. The female victim was brought to another location before being killed. And again, there's no robbery or sexual assault that meets the Zodiac's MO. Um, But I have, in my research, shows that he established himself in Dublin, California, temporarily um, living in uh, Kamandorsky Village in Pleasanton, California, while he was awaiting his four-year residency um, outside of NAS Alameda. And so I can pinpoint him in the area in 1967. Do I know what he was doing on June 8th? No, but it fits that MO of the lover's lane, the teenagers that he had targeted in 60, uh, in December of 68, July of 69 and so on. So, but as I understand, um, Fermin Rodriguez and um, Anadine Molina were much older than teenagers. They were in their 30s, correct? That I don't know, Ned, but you probably know that. <laughs> okay, yes, and if anybody would like to read more about that, you can find the book Cracked by uh, Chad Burke, and that should be available on What Pat or Wit book. But um, to move on, though, I think, though, that you guys have talked about some things in the past in regards to the motive, and you have also provided a lot of info about the timelines. I think the best parts of ZodiacKillerBomb.com were showing some things about the timelines, providing explanations about how he was deployed from, um, what was that, January 7th of 1969 and returns on July – sorry, January 7th of 1960 – yeah, 69 and returns on July 2nd of 1969, right before the Blue Rock Springs shooting. But – do you think that he had some type of frustration with the military, frustration with his career, frustration with his life that would inspire him to create the Zodiac persona? Uh, yes, I do. And, um, you know, that is also evident in his records. He he requests onshore duty a couple of different times, I feel like. And then he also had an incident um, – you know, where he was court-martialed and demoted from an AMS-2 to AMS-3, and he had to work his way back up to AMS-2 in 1960. That happened in 1960, and it worked his way up to in 1965. So I believe that he didn't enjoy deployment. I think he enjoyed the metalworking, you know, the mechanic, the um, restoration part of his job, but I don't really believe that he enjoyed being away and locked on a, an aircraft carrier for six to nine months. That I don't think he, it, and, and it, it was interesting to me that he has that in his military records where he talks about, you know, requesting onshore duty. And then of course we know that when the USS Enterprise fire happened on January 14th, 1969, you know, it took them a couple of weeks in Hawaii to get back up and running. You know, they finished their all the all the uh, sailors. Well, there was a handful. I don't know if it was the air squadrons or not, but they had to redo their fire training at a NAS Treasure Island in March. And then, of course, they finished their assignment. They come back on July second of nineteen sixty nine, and now he's landlocked. You know, we don't know, but this murder happens in July fourth. And the ship is taken out of service, brought back to the East Coast, I think it was Virginia, Newport News, to be restored, refueled, revitalized so that they could obviously release it again. So it was off line. The ship was off line until at least 1970, 1971. And that's where we see the Zodiac activity pick up while L.D. Hill is coincidentally assigned on shore. <laughs> so it's interesting. Okay, yeah, so, and um, I believe, though, you also said that he had some issue with his children where he was um, experiencing some type of family trouble in 1969. Is that correct? Uh, yes. You want to take that one? Yes. Sure. Yes, we're going to hear from Jeff on this one. Um, yes, so um, he had, uh, you know, taken the children back to uh, 
California, and uh, my mother obviously was she just went to school there. It got pictures of her in the high school uh, yearbook, and um, basically, uh, you know, he was tricked into bringing the children back and didn't realize that uh, he was being tricked. And when he showed up with the kids, um, I guess the great uncle of mine, a few of them, pulled shotguns out and said, and my grandmother came out and said, these kids are staying here. And uh, that's what happened. He ended up, uh, you know, trying to get custody of them. I think it, he, they tricked them back into Ohio to, you know, bring the kids back and then, you know, um, the the white the my grandmother, the the mother of uh, his children of, of that part of the family uh, said, "Hey, you know what? These kids aren't going with you." So I'm pretty sure it pissed him off, and he went back to California without them. And then all of a sudden, you see more activity. You know, he's threatening school buses and bombs, and you know, and I think it just kind of sparked uh, more f fire in them to create more chaos. And Paul Stein, now you have another murder of a cab driver again, which is interesting because it's like, I don't know why, but it seems like he's associating the cab driver with his first wife. And almost like there's this vendetta, like he can't get to her, so he's going after and just lashing out on Paul Stein. Okay, though, but if I can recap what I'm, what Jeff just said is that he went to visit the family, and that was in Ohio, yeah, right? Over summer break. Over a summer break, and this would have been, what was it, August of 1969, mm -hmm. before the Lake Berryessa stabbing, and he brought his kids back to a family home, one of the um, relatives' homes, right? And what you said was that that he was um, almost being denied custody of his children, that people pulled shotguns on him and said, you can't take the kids with you, mm -hmm. so then... Now he's pissed off in a different way, and that's what triggered some uh, some expansions of the Zodiac persona. Now, exactly. The Zodiac would do a lot of things after the murder of Paul Stein. He stated he would never publicly announce his crimes in the same way, but he did mail in more ciphers, more letters, greeting cards, and I guess we have to go a little bit chronologically. And one of them is the Z13 cipher, the My Name Is cipher. And you, Melissa, I have found have – you found at least three ways to solve the cipher or is this a fair assessment of what you think that he put his name in the cipher three different ways? Is that fair? Yes, that's fair. Mm -hmm. And would you like to tell us how your solutions work? Uh, yes. So there are three different ways. I mean one of which would be – it's 13 characters. Without spaces, it would be Mr. Loring D. Hill. Okay, so that's one. That's really not my favorite solution. But the other two are pretty convincing where you've got, you know, the six alpha or digits or characters. Then you've got that little circle with what people think is an eight. I think it's an H for Hill representing a null or a space. And then you've got your next letter, which would be his middle in, representing uh, his middle initial. Then you have another circle with a space. And then you have the four characters of his last name, Hill. But then you say, well, how come this one circle with the H in the front shows up as the, I think it's like the fifth character. Why isn't that one a null? Because when you put his name in backward, it serves as a null for right before, um, after Hill. So for example... I just showed you the first one forward, Loring space D space Hill. But when you do from the back moving forward, you put Loring, then you've got your circle H character, a middle initial for, I think it's an M or a K for the middle name. And then another, that, that other null. And then you've got four characters left for Hill. So working backward to the front. So it's almost like a reverse where it works both ways, forward and backward for his name. Well, the circles with the H's or A's, whatever they are, they definitely do divide the segments. And are is this a fair thing to say on your behalf that the reason why there are two letters that are just in the middle of everything, the K and the M, is because it's meant to show a middle initial 
And like that is almost like, okay, you can look at the name going this way or the name going that way. The circled H's are the spaces, and those are like the directions. Okay, you can put my name in this way or you can put my name in that way, forwards, backwards. And I think you even have a third one, right? Yeah, I mean, well, the third one would just be straight Mr. Loring D. Hill. That fits. Um, what I find interesting, too, is um, that first letter of the cipher is an A, is an a so for me, if you do that A, and then if if that represents M for Mister, that would be aviation mechanic. And then you know you and I have talked about as well the other symbols that represent his occupation being that um, some people describe it as what like the Aries, yeah. yeah, like an Aries symbol. But I think it's the naval uh, anchor. And then you have N A M at the end, N is in Nancy, A is in Apple, M is in Mary. Now, that could be either short for NAM, because we know he was stationed in NAM, or it could be Naval Aviation Mechanic. We, you know, NAM. We're not sure, but I think, again, it's another striking similarity to point to this person. Right. So it sounds like you have, like, a lot of clues and information in the Z13 cipher. But if we move on, we can come back perhaps to the Zodiac Z32 later on. But there's one Zodiac communication that a lot of people like to zone in on, and it's the Halloween card. This was mailed on October 27th of 1970, addressed to Paul Avery, although his name was misspelled on it, on the envelope. And Jeff, would you like to talk about some observations that you guys have made about the Halloween card? Sure. So, well, Melissa believes that this Halloween card is actually a confession and the connection to the USS Enterprise. On the card, it says, by fire, by, and maybe this ain't the right order, by fire, by gun, by knife, by rope. And there's no known Zodiac killings by fire. And concerning he was on the U.S. Enterprise for that January 14th, 1969 fire and 28 people burned to death by a so-called accidental bomb, Zuni bomb that went off and it just so happened to be right next to his squadron. And even though they did training and all that kind of stuff uh, back then, <clears throat> we believe that the 28 men that died on January 14th, 1969, were part of that Zodiac confession saying that, hey, you know, 37 victims, here's 28 of them by fire. Um, and, you know, also, you know, the fact that, you know, it says on the, the card, it says, you ate to know my name, I feel it in my bones. And I think that's a huge clue on the way the bones are, are set. They call them LD in the military. Um, he was known for being LD. Everyone called him LD. The bones, uh, right arm is an L, the left arm is a D. Now, there's a pumpkin that's covering his pelvis area, and, you know, uh, somebody online mentioned that, hey, the pelvis is the shape of an H. Well, we have lowering Dale Hill, uh, you know, uh, so, and then we came up with, all right, it's, Melissa came up with, hey, it's, okay, he's a descendant of his father, uh, World War II, you know, Korean War. That's when they introduced the pumpkin bomb. So, I mean, can there be more than one symbolic meaning to it? I mean, there can be. Um, there's the, the hand uh, that has 14 in it. We believe that has something to do with his eye, like targeting on that. Like, I have something to do with the. January 14th, um, and, uh, you know, circle around it, and I'm okay, because his mother went on record saying that LD is okay, he, you know, made it safely off the ship when the thing went down, um, you know, and Melissa also noticed that, you know, the 13 eyes on that card, and Loring Dale Hill was part of the Zappers, which was the early warning squadron. It was the Zappers, the 13th Squadron. And we believe that that has something to do with it, the 13 eyes uh, for the early warning squadron. Um, 
on the other side of the card. I believe I uh, kind of covered that side of the card. The other side of the card, it kind of has the bones again. Kind of look like he's flying. You know, I came up with a, you know, a Google search. You know, what would 14 mean? Because it's weird how it says the number 4-T-E-E-N. So I'm like, okay. And then I seen that, you know, hey, the 14th chapter of The Wizard of Oz is where they introduced the flying monkeys. Now, is that true or not? I don't know, but it did lead us to more clues, you know, uh, and more ideas of it. And uh, we know that, uh, you know, you need 100 hours of flight time in order to become a aviation pilot, and you're considered a flying monkey till then. Now, would that be true or not? We don't know. But Melissa later noticed that, you know, there's still... Uh, like lettering in his legs of the bones, like, uh, you know, it could be. And um, let's see, there's more on that back of that card. Yeah, well, and to add to that, well, you know, in the front it says, you ache to know my name. Then he says, you turn the, the inside of the card, he says, but why spoil the fun? And then his arms go down. So when Jeff said his arms are in the position of L.D., when you look at the second part of that card and he says, well, why spoil the fun? His arms are just kind of like, you know, laying there. They're not in the position of the initials anymore. So to me, that's another big kind of clue. And yes, and I just want to share one thing. When Jeff was talking about his mother said that he was okay after the fire on the Enterprise, his mother was a reporter for the newspaper, correct? Mm -hmm. And those were the quote. Those were the words that she used in the article when she talked about the fire on the Enterprise and that her son was on the Enterprise. And as we said, this was in January of 1969, but she said that he is okay. It's a direct quotation, right? Correct, and that's why we're referring to that the 14 in the hand, and the hand has the okay sign. And then, you know, he's looking right into that hand. Now, I've had Dale Julin on the program previously. He's the author of the book Catching Zodiac. And he made the observation that the death wheel that has been featured that says slaves, paradise, by rope, by knife, by gun, by fire, has 37 letters. And do you think that was done intentionally by the Zodiac? I, I, would, I would say yes, because if they didn't overlap that A between slaves and paradise, it would be 38. So I think he intentionally did that um, to show that, hey, this is – my 37 victims between by fire, by rope, by knife, and by gun, including the Enterprise and the known slayings in the Bay Area. And it could also be contributed to other murders that are Zodiac style that they believe he has something to do with, but it hasn't been confirmed. But many people believe that those other murders are from him. And I mean, if... If he was off by a number or two, I mean, because he didn't know how many people did die by fire at first, and then later it was confirmed with 28 victims, you know, and then you got five known victims that are Zodiac between, you know, Paul Stein murder and the rest of the murders that they they confirm that it's him. They're saying that's him. And then the four possibility or, you know, could he be adding or distract, you know, other, uh, you know, times where he made these killings, you know, you know, he may be off by the number, but I think that, you know, he is contributing the 37 to the people that he had something to do with, which you asked us before, Ned, you know, do we believe that he had something to do with this fire? You know, and as we go on to this, we kind of believe it more that he would be once we got this military record showing that he's trying to get off of the ship he's trying to get off the ship and what would be a better way than to create an accidental bomb blow up the ship get back on the shore now he can murder more people we can add up the 37 victims he can he has time to sit down on the bay area write cards do more murders and um we just think he has something to do with it, for sure well and again it's hard to prove us you know, 50 plus years later. So it's still alleged. We don't know, but there are similarities. And I would also say, um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, he claimed the, the murders in San Jose, Ned, that maybe are the other three 
to four that would fit the 37 total body count, even though we know someone else was convicted of those. But he did claim that he did that. And are you talking about the snoozy furlong Billick murders? Yes. Mm -hmm. And what exactly would be your take on those? Because you said somebody else was convicted. His name was Carl F. Warner. And um, do you think that, that he was unjustly convicted or not? I mean, I haven't had an opportunity to dig in to his case and look at all of the evidence. So I really don't know, but I do know that it is possible that a serial killer, I think it was the Green River serial killer, that truck driver was killing people and already two people that wrote confessions were convicted of it and they weren't guilty. <laughs> so it can happen. You mean the Green River killer, Gary Green? Ridgway? I don't, I've never no, heard that the, before. Oh, it's the, well, the... I don't remember which one it was, but it was the the semi truck driver that was killing people in I want to say Oregon. Okay, I'm not sure about that. That he was convicted for the murders of Kathy Snooze of sorry Deborah Furlong and Kathy Snoozy. No, and Kathy Billick. I'm, no, no, completely separate case. He has nothing to do with that case. Okay, okay. But gotcha. what I'm saying is, it has happened before where two people have written a confession or they were convicted. They're sitting in jail. While the serial killer is still out killing people. So I think it's plausible. Oh, yes, absolutely. And um, if we're just going to say very clearly, Melissa did not say that Gary Ridgway was responsible for the snoozy and furlong murders. I guess I just misunderstood. But yes, yes, people do confess to crimes that they didn't commit. Now, the Zodiac Killer played games. He said he would not tell us about all the crimes that he would do. So is it possible, too, that he would just claim a few murders just to screw with the cops? Yeah, I mean, that's a possibility that, you know, maybe they did go down for the crimes, the people that did go down for the crimes. But he's like, hey, no, it was me to try to screw with the cops saying, hey, it was me. Wait, you know, maybe it wasn't them really, you know. I have a theory on that. Why did he limit himself to claiming only five murders? And and again, this goes back to Top Gun, the movie. <laughs> Where five kills is an ace? Right. I don't know. Just saying. Maybe that's why. It was, again, just another ode to, hey, you know, what his experience is and what drives his identity was definitely ingrained in his occupation. Okay, yes, and um, I've thought about that too somewhat. Mm -hmm. But as far as um, the crimes that the Zodiac has committed. I mean, I completely agree with Jeff that I think he was someone who played games. I mean, all of it is a game. He even says it on the um, Halloween card, you know, why spoil it, right? He is openly stating that this is all a game to him. But then he also talks about how it's this um, secret belief system he has. I would be reborn in paradise and those whom I have killed will be my slaves. And have you encountered anything with your suspect that would talk about that? Slaves, paradise, death, and all that? Uh, you know what? We have not found much of that. I mean, we know he liked to play cards and, you know, that kind of stuff. And we know, like uh, Melissa was saying earlier, where he was at, you know, he did training at, you know, uh, you know, at certain places, you know, uh, and, and we have pictures of showing him, you know, playing cards, you know, so he liked playing cards. I, I We don't have anything. All right, and I understand that, but... There is something else, though, that I would like to discuss with you guys, and this relates to the Scorpion letters and the Scorpion ciphers. And I've had a couple of requests to discuss these on Black Box Online Radio, and I've never done a presentation on them myself. However, I would really like to know your take on these because these came well after the Zodiac crimes of the 1960s. But I want to know exactly the observations that you have made about them. Okay, so to answer your question about the Scorpion letters, um, I wrote a couple blogs on ZodiacKillerBomb.com about this. So uh, before I uh, obtained his military records, I was researching extensively whether or not I could pinpoint the squadrons he belonged in. And I narrowed down two of the squadrons, which were the uh, V, I believe it's the VAW1... 32 and the VAQ 13 and the 13 squadron is the zappers their electro electric countermeasure attack squadron 
Um, again, why we think that 13 in the cipher is significant or symbolic, the 13 eyes, the 13 buttons in the naval sailor uniform. You've got a lot of these, like, you know, these similarities thread and woven throughout this case. The other squadron, so he was in 13, I want to say, in 1968, and then he joined the 132 Scorpions in 1969. And you're right. I feel like there's something to why, you know, these the dragon card came out a little bit later, and then the, squad, the Scorpion letters from 1991. Um talks about the scorpion letters talk about new jersey well ld was stationed on reserve out of maryland but he had ties to nas lakehurst new jersey he had been stationed there previously in his career um uh and so i feel like that is some type of a tip of the hat but i think he was more comfortable with revealing a little bit more about his identity once he left california so when we look at the citizen card you know, that's like, or the citizen letter, where it's said that that was, I think, one of the only ones postmarked out of Alameda. To me, he's telling me, you're a citizen. Yeah, I'm now going to hang up this Zodiac persona. I'm going to become a citizen. But this is where he went. He didn't hang up the military career, but he hung up the Zodiac persona because he went to Texas in 71 and 72 and then went on reserve in 73 and left Texas. And so as he's leaving California, we see him at the same time that LD is wrapping up his residency there, kind of hang up that Zodiac persona and feel more comfortable with giving a little bit more about, you know, maybe his identity or his associations. Okay, though, and you've talked a lot about some clues that would indicate that he was in the Navy and in the military. And Melissa, the first time you and I ever talked, and Jeff was there as well, you asked a question, although it was rhetorical, and that was, how can some people propose suspects who aren't coming from a military background? Because it really appears that there are so many clues that indicate that the Zodiac was ex-military, and you guys have zoned in on the Navy, looking at all these clues that suggest that he was in the Navy. And because this is Zodiac Monday, and I talk about all types of suspects and theories on this channel. What is your message to people who are proposing a Zodiac killer suspect who does not have a military background? I would say there's absolutely zero evidence that it would be somebody without a military background. I don't believe it's a business background. I don't believe it's a financial, you know, shark that's doing these killings. I don't believe it's a CEO of anything. Um, no, like I have extensive experience in the business world and i just don't see anything that would point to someone being rich rich or a person of high pristine but i see a, a lot a lot of arrows pointing to military particularly naval background naval aviation naval communications naval you know coordinates maps uh mount diablo was a major naval communications hub i mean there's so many more than than pointing to just somebody out of the corporate world or a business owner or somebody of high stature and value and pristine exactly pristine. and we definitely believe it's him because you know basing off of this timeline that we have created uh be with the records mm -hmm. that we have proven data and research that we have that shows him, you know, coming in and out of this areas, you know, where it's the type of person where, hey, you know what, I'm I'm here for this much time and I'm out of here. So there, he's getting in, doing what he's doing and getting out of there before anyone can catch him and on his way doing another mission with the military. No activity. When he leaves, he comes back in. Now we have more activity. So... That's why we believe it. Yeah, and I think he got away with it because he wasn't a civilian. That's that's why he got away with it. Everyone's looking for a civilian. Nobody is suspecting. Yeah, there are a little few clues to the military, but they're not really looking at the deep details behind what he is saying. And they don't really know. They don't have anybody to pinpoint. So they're going to pinpoint whoever their best case scenario might be. But that doesn't mean there isn't a better case scenario out there or a better suspect that fits.
Well, now wait a second, though, because you have said two things, and one of them is that you don't see any evidence of someone having a business background, and another one not having the military background, but some of the suspects who are high-profile business people were in the military, mm -hmm. most notably Shel Cavale. He was a pilot during World War II, and I've recently talked about Donald L. Blinko on the channel, who was a financial analyst, but he was also a member of the Coast Guard, and what do... Why exactly would a suspect like that not fit? Because you said you come from a business background as well, which I know. And what, what exactly points away from somebody having that type of education or work experience? And we should also point out that there's another Zodiac suspect named John Parr Cox, who lived very close to Shel Cavale, and he is also a high-profile executive. Why would these suspects be absolutely in the wrong barrel, according to you? Well, and again, I definitely think we need to narrow in on someone with military experience, but this person that we have here as a suspect is a career military, 20 years in the service, a lot of detail pointing to uh, his service, uh, you know, um, the vernacular he uses ties into that. He's got ties to Oklahoma as well, where he was stationed in Norman, Oklahoma. He also married somebody from Oklahoma. We know he called into the Oklahoma radio station. I just feel like we've got more points of detail than the other suspects who are not career military. Well, and another thing to do is we have produced research to show this. You know, uh, we do encourage these other people that have these suspects to produce their timelines to show them when they're at work with the military if they're going to be a military person and when they're back into that area you know that would narrow it down you know produce your stuff show us what you got let's compare apples to apples and and what's going to happen is we're just going to keep moving up in this ratings to show that this suspect that we have should be looked at and we are really believe in that this is the guy. Now, I don't know how you would feel about this, but would you guys be interested in discussing some of the other suspects and shit saying why you think they are wrong? Say, for example, Arthur Lee Allen, the prime suspect, and the one that Robert Graysmith wrote about in his books, as well as featured in the uh, 2007 Fincher film. Arthur Lee Allen was more or less a failed member of the United States Navy, so you talked about all these naval clues, but why would Arthur Lee Allen not be the Zodiac? Again, just not uh, lack of detail. It's all sur it's all very surface information that may tie him in. And of course, we know he was ruled out, and he claimed not to be the Zodiac. That's another clue. <laughs> but how exactly do you mean he was ruled out? Well, he was ruled out by wasn't he ruled out by DNA? Yes, he was ruled out by the DNA test from the two thousand and two primetime show. However, um. Some people will dispute those results, say, was that actually the Zodiac's DNA because mm -hmm. it was touch DNA from the outside of the stamp? But, Jeff, I think you had I, something. I, I really think that, you know, you know, our suspect looking almost exactly like the sketch, okay? Now, if you were to just start off with that, you know, just start off with that. Take all the suspects out there and just anybody that does not look like them, just move them out of the way. And then... Look at living and working in that area. Who, you know, who isn't? Move them out of the way. You don't have no data to back up any of your claims. Move them out of the way. That's, you You know, I think it's just meat and potatoes here. You know, just keep it simple, right to the point. You know, if if if, if they don't meet that criteria, you know, they, you know, they, maybe they're in the, they were in the service. Okay, fine. If they were in the service, great. Give us the military records. Let's, if we have to, next step is to FOIA their military records so we can shut them down just to, to you know, take away uh, distraction of th who this suspect we have that should be uh, recognized and put up forth. FBI should be looking all over the suspect. And I like how you uh, explained it earlier. It's almost like you have an entire puzzle right? With one piece missing and you kind of put this piece in and now you have a complete picture. 
they don't have a complete picture. They might have partial pictures. They may not, you know, they can't explain, I think, all the points of detail that we can explain. And again, through our research, they can speculate. I think they've got speculation, but not necessarily research or even circumstantial evidence, to be frank, where we have at least enough to say this person should be seriously looked at or, you know, we don't know that he's did it, but he should be focused on by the authorities to either be ruled out or to be proven. Now, Jeff, when you were saying that the, the talking about the similarities between the suspects and the sketch, you mean the fact that Arthur Lee Allen doesn't resemble the composite for see, the suspects that have been witnessed, whether it's the Lake Barrios of Voyeur or the one after the Stein murder, very clearly had full heads of hair and Arthur Lee Allen was – almost bald, completely he was balding, not to mention that he had a very big moon face and the uh, Zodiac's composite after the Stein murder had somewhat of a pointed jawline and maybe some wider cheekbones, definitely not moon face. Is that what you were talking about? Exactly, because, you know, we have a suspect that's in and out of this area. Nobody has a clue who this guy is. He doesn't live there. He doesn't reside there other than living on base and moving from base to base. And, you know, you know, people are going to, you know, know somebody's face, you know, from being in the area. This guy's killing people, you know, every few months or whatever it is in the same state, you know. So, uh, you know, his face is going to be familiar to somebody, you know, around the neighborhood or something. Nobody does. So now they're picking out people that kind of look like him. They're picking out all that. They're grabbing straws from here to there. And, you know, and what we have mentioned, and I've heard it mentioned before, that you can put a story together and put a lot of things together, and it could almost make sense. But when it comes down to the grassroots of it, it's you need to back up these claims with something. If it's a military guy, fine. Give us some research. Let's see his timelines. Because if... He was in the military, which everyone believes this guy was in the military. We're, we're moving towards, hey, this, this could be a military guy. And let's say he is a Navy guy. Okay, so all right, we got other um, suspects that are in the military, in the Navy, Coast Guard, whatever. But there's going to be uh, some kind of uh, data or, you know, uh, freedom of information to the military records. If we pull those, okay, or if they – Go out of their way. If they're so into their suspect and they believe them that much, then they should be able to get those records. And once those records come out, it's going to their, – their suspect ain't going to be worth of nothing because, you know, if, if they're away on a mission with the military that they're in – and these killings are happening, they're not a suspect. You know what I mean? So I think that's what we need to do is is get more information out of that just to kind of move away the distractions. Right, and I think our motive is stronger. We actually, our suspect has a pretty clear motive that fits the description and the MO of the crimes that differ. I mean, there's a difference between couples versus a cab driver. It's just, and everyone wants to figure that out. And from what we've been told, it's it's that motive is plausible. Okay, though, but to Jeff, to come back to your point, though, all of the suspects that I have mentioned so far, Arthur Lee Allen, Shel Cavale, Donald L. Blinko, John Parr Cox, they can all be placed in the Bay Area at the time because they were either out of the military or they were um, already established in careers as John Parr Cox was um, not even – you know, like he was someone who uh, was on uh, stateside during World War II as opposed to Shel Cavale, who was a pilot. But these guys were all working in San Francisco. Lee Allen is messing around. But then we have Donald L. Blinko as a financial analyst. Shel Cavale is a businessman, although it's possible that he was in London at the time. John Parr Cox ran Parr Terminal in California. But, I mean, in all fairness, they were in the Bay Area. Sure. But no, it still comes down to... Uh, the fact that, you know, the height, the weight, what they look like, you know what I mean? I mean, you got to start knocking them out of the way. You know what I'm saying? If they don't look like them, they shouldn't even be a suspect. If they, you know, are not that height or they're not that weight. They also were not, have no uh, association to a scorpion or a dragon where our suspect we can explain the scorpion card. We can explain the dragon card. We can explain that six-month break. So they're in the Bay Area, Ned. What explains why they took the six-month break? 
they were napping. <laughs> right. So, so like Melissa was saying, going back to the the dragon card and scorpion card. Well, you know, you got a cowboy riding a dragon. L.D. Hill was from the farm. He was basically kind of a hillbilly, you know what I'm saying, from the farm that went to the military. He's a cowboy riding a dragon. What did they call uh, the helicopters when they flew them? Riding the dragon. I mean, now we got the scorpion card, you know what I'm saying? You know, and he was part of the scorpion. There's just... That's the, you know, they weren't part of the scorpion squad. What are there's, what do they have to do with the scorpion? They have nothing to do with it. our suspect has plenty to do with the scorpion squad or the scorpion itself, the symbolism behind it and the dragon. And also a, when we talk about, maybe you're going to get to the Kathleen Johns, but LD Hill owned a gold tan station wagon that fit the description that Kathleen Johns gave the clothes he wore fit the description of a naval personnel. Um, the fact that he had three young children at the time at home would explain the condition of the inside of that car that she described. Again, all the other suspects don't have an answer to that. So they just deny it was a Zodiac. You know, it's easier to do that. Okay, though. So we've talked about a lot of the crimes, but some of the possible crimes we talked about were only pre-1968. We didn't really get a chance to talk about Anything post-1969 in regards to the crimes themselves. You brought up the Kathleen Johns incident. That's the attempted abduction of Kathleen Johns and her baby. But now, let's keep going with that if both of you are willing. And we can talk about the disappearance of Donna Lass from 1970. Yeah, to talk about Donna Lass. Um, and again, I've been, just like you, Ned, haven't had a lot of a chance to get into the Donna Lass murder. Again, it's... It's disputed whether it was the Zodiac Killer or not, but I can tell you some observations between that case and my suspect that I've recently come across. So I go on. Um, it happened Labor Day weekend. Uh, we know, I think, for LD, he would have been off. It would have been a, a holiday, a national holiday on Labor Day. So he would have had time to, I think, abduct her the night before and all of Labor Day to dispose of her body from Sierra, Nevada, all the way back west where her body was found on the way home. And I also know, I've been told by family that he was a gambler. He did gamble. He did frequent casinos. He played cars. He was a pool shark. Um, I have speculated that he would make trips. Again, like I told you, he was landlocked after 1969, that he would make tricks, trips to NAS Fallon, which is another naval air base in the Sierra Nevada area. And so if he was doing jobs there or assignments there and driving back and forth, that would put him in the area of that Donna Lass disappeared in. And again, another piece that I think other suspects cannot explain, why was Donna Lass abducted? Why did he so quote unquote claim it through the card, the peaks peek through the pines card? And yet I can say, and again, I have not, found any evidence of NAS Fallon in the military records that I've reviewed so far. I'm not going to say I have a complete list of military records. I think there are some that are missing. Um, I have evidence in here that he was on the USS America, but I have all I have is a medal he won. I don't have the assignment dates. I don't have anything else. It's really kind of weird. So whether that's classified, whatever he was doing in NAS Fallon, if he was there at all, but I do feel like there's a possibility he could have been there. Okay, though, and is Donna Lass factored into the total number of victims in the 37 that is written out by the Zodiac and, as we've now said, multiple places? Uh, not at this time, no. But let's see. 37 murders you believe were attributed to the Zodiac. That was 28 from the USS Enterprise. That would mean that he murdered nine people, but then we would also have the five victims – yeah. from from um, the San Francisco Bay Area. So 5 and 20, that's 33. Who are the additional four? Yeah, so the the three from San Jose area. The other one could have been Sherry. I don't think it's Sherry Joe Base. I think you're right. I think it might be more plausible that Donna Lass was included in that, but I would have to pinpoint the dates that he claimed 37 victims versus whether that, that was before Donna Lass was murdered or not. Off the top of my head, I don't recall. If it was before or after. 
But I also kind of think he had different body counts in different areas. So to your point, this 37 is just this Northern California area. Cause obviously we know later he claims a hundred, but he could have a completely different body count. He didn't even talk about in Southern California. Right. I was going to ask you that too, because you said that he committed the first murder in Texas, right? Mm -hmm. In 1957. And then if it's the crimes that you just listed off, then that would not be factored into the 37, right? right. Correct. Yeah. But if we go forward in time to the 100, that relates to the letter that was mailed in 1986 after the Sacramento Freeway murders. Mm -hmm. And do you believe uh, that either the crime was authentic or the letter was authentic? It has to be authentic, a letter in your opinion, mm -hmm. because you just said you accept the body count. Yeah, I do. Um, we, we also kind of see this theme like anytime he's going through – uh, you know, kind of a traumatic event. We it kind of corresponds with the zodiac activity in terms of the dates. So, like you know, his father passed away in 1965. We've got you know the murder of murders of uh, was it Snoozy in 64 or 65? Well, the um, are you talking about the swindle murders the swindle in 64? Murders. Yeah, the swindle murders of 64. You know, we just it, we, and I, we could look at that and say. And I'm trying to remember what incident happened in 86. That was the um, Sacramento Freeway murders, the murders of Koi and Se Chow and Choi Fao Se Li. They were the couple of Laotian origin that were parked on the side of a highway, and somebody gunned them down. And that's really all we have. There's a suspicious person seen in the area, and then there's a Zodiac letter that comes that talks about some information that possibly could have come from the killer. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's someone who just learned this from some in some other way, but... And was that the same area though that Donna Lass's body was found? Was along that same highway or but north of it? I'm not quite sure either. I'd have to look that. at a map, but she was found in Placer County, California, closer to the Nevada state line. And I guess this freeway is going through Sacramento. Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure. Yeah, well, there was some significance um, that some event that happened in LD's life in 1986, and I don't recall off the top of my head what it is. Maybe we can circle back with that. But yeah, I, I believe there was some traumatic event there too that maybe caused, I mean, I know that they had reunions for the Enterprise fires. They had lots of reunions going back to California. They could have been, he traveled, he still traveled in his retirement. Um, but again, I haven't gone that far. I'm kind of just focusing on what we know right now. And then I'm hoping if it's proven that it's him, the rest of the pieces will fall into place and we can start answering, I think, some of these other outlier questions that we have. But, yeah, it's, it's definitely on the table to look at. Well, if you want to talk about proving that it's him over another suspect, we've gone through some suspects like Arthur Lee Allen and Shel Cavalli that are widely discussed, but one of them we have not talked about yet, and his name is Richard Gajkowski, and I know you've looked into him just a little bit, and he is perhaps one of the most widely discussed suspects online. And if we, again, want to talk about why one suspect is more plausible than another, why would Richard Gajkowski not be the Zodiac killer? Again, uh, not enough to show that he had any association with the communications that we know to be from the Zodiac. I just don't see it being that same person. And again, I think like what we talked about before, if he was in Europe during the time of the activity, that would rule him out. If I said, someone said to me, you know, Jeff is a Zodiac killer, and I'm looking into this just because he looks like the sketch, right? We know he looks like the sketch. But it's true. <laughs> But I have to then look at the entire picture. I cannot just have narrow focus in one spot. I have to look at everything. And if it's not a complete picture, I'm not going to consider it relevant. And I think that's where Grakowski is. There's lots of rumors about he and I think um, Darlene, Darlene Farron's relationships. There's rumors about him being in. Um, what was his age? At the yeah, time what was too? his age? 33. Okay. So, Pretty close, but close. yes, LD Hill was thirty four, right at the time. Right, um, but him being in uh, New York, Albany, New York, you know, some of those stories, I I don't know if those are true or can be proven either. I'm trying to figure out if LD was in um, New York in Albany. There are some associations with Albany that I've written about in some of the pages that I see. 
But can I say in for a definite fact he was ever there? I could maybe say he drove through the area. Was he there uh, getting his, you know, dismissal medical uh, exam? At, it, was there a military hospital there? Why does he have such an affiliation or affinity with nurses and medical? Like even that 2001 card, he's talking about like there's this nurses and he mentions that hospital. What is it? Like. LaGuardia Honda, right, and- where he worked for Honda in Ohio. So there's like little tiny, vague clues, but there's not a lot to right. go and, on. And, and just to go further with that, you know, LD uh, passed away in 1996 of a heart, a massive heart attack. Mm-hmm. And we believe that, you know, it's very possible that these letters continued because of that partner that he had that helped him maybe wanted to live on the memory of him, screw with the community still. Maybe these letters were, you know, certain letters were, were written and maybe, you know, they just were never delivered because he passed away. Maybe, you know, uh, that was, you know, because of the person his partner had so much knowledge of him, they were able to pick apart more stuff and, you know, add it later, you know, and uh, that's why it makes it a little more confusing, I guess. This is a complicated case. You know, it's probably one of the most complicated cases I've ever seen, you know, but when you know the person and you can take all this information about this person and it just fills in easily, you know, and it's, I guess when you don't know about this other partner, which we will eventually put this on the table and a a lot of this information out there, you know, it's going to make more sense, you know, but it's not our, it's not our, you know, I don't want to say responsibility. We just, we, we just can't do that because we're not the authorities. You know what I'm saying? I have DNA. My mother has DNA. You know what I'm saying? We'd love to give the DNA over to the FBI. Now, does that mean that, uh, you know, the DNA that they might have could match? Maybe so. Could it be a DNA from somebody else, just some random other person that had nothing to do with the case? That could be true, too. Maybe they already ruled that out. Um, But at the end of the day, you know. And to just expound upon that too there could be evidence more physical evidence at his place of origin that no one knows about that should kind of be looked at i think in further detail and then from there like if there are bullets or ballistics that possibly match the description in some of these cases it's not always just about dna there are other aspects of the case that no one has looked into that maybe could surface that's still out there you know, Jeff and I just came from New Orleans. We spent a week there, and a lot of it is preserved in New Orleans. There's not much that has changed, even after Katrina. So I think there's a high probability that there is some preservation of some physical evidence, but we have to get the authorities in there to look at that because Jeff and I are not authorized to do so. <laughs> so um, that's, you know, another point to make. Okay, and right now at this time, I would like to ask, Do you guys have a final concluding message for the listeners of Black Box Online Radio? Where can people find your material? How can they find your things? Is there anything else that you would like to say? Any final send-off? What is uh, maybe some more convincing evidence that you have about your Zodiac Killer suspect, L.D. Hill? But, of course, uh, please begin with how they can find your stuff. Sure. Um, You can go on to Zodiac Killer and Me, and it's the and sign. Uh, so it's not confusing, on Facebook page. Uh, It is a private group, but we are very open to allow people into the group or uh, ZodiacKillerBomb.com where we are under construction still because we're still filling in the blanks. We have some information. We're working on it, and, um, you know, that's kind of where we're at right now. But, um, you know, it's just, you know, I would say – you know, if you're really interested in this case and you want to know more about it, I would say, you know, look at the suspects that are out there and compare 
apples to apples, you know, compare our suspect to theirs, you know, and I think that it'll get you in the right direction. Yeah. And again, absolutely. I would not still be looking into this if I didn't hit a wall. I haven't hit the wall yet in terms of something that says this isn't this guy. I do look at this case and and to answer your question, not I do look at the other suspects and I just, if I didn't know about this case, I could see why some of them would go down the roads they've gone down. But when you look more closely at this individual, the rest of them really do kind of fall by the wayside with everything we've been able to uncover so far. So. Okay, and this has been from Jeff and Melissa of ZodiacKillerBomb.com. And right now, I really want to know what, from you guys, what do you in the audience think about luring Dale Hill as a Zodiac suspect? Please give any feedback that you want. Respond to any of the points that have been discussed in this episode. If you like this bu- episode, you can hit the like button and subscribe. It really helps out the channel. And also, just one more time, share what you truly think in the comments section. You can also go through some of the links in the description box. I have my personal Facebook there where I release shorts and reels almost every single day on Facebook and Instagram, BlackboxNet88 over on Instagram. And for larger things, you can send them to me at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. And that will be all for me now. Goodbye.